page on the screen. So where is this? All right, so last time we, when we uh, went through the discussion of forecasting, we started off with this very basic spreadsheet where we looked at how do we go about doing a linear regression based uh, forecast system. And we came up with a figure for the sales forecast here which if you remember how we did it, we had to, to figure out what's the equation for the linear regression line, okay? So um, just as a quick recap, let's do this in a minute and let's try and get that linear regression line. So in the information given here, uh, we're given information on, on advertising and we're also given information on uh, the sales associated with every given level of advertising, okay? So for example, in month one, they spent $2,500 on advertising and they got sales of around 264,000 units of product, okay? So with this information, as, as a forecast, I would be interested in projecting what if we had a certain level of advertising. And in this case, the, uh, the level of advertising that we're given was $1,750 and we wanted to find out how much sales can we expect with that level of advertising, okay? So the approach that I discussed was to go into your data tab on Excel and open data analysis and to open your regression tool and then say okay. And with the regression tool, you'd input your Y range. Your Y range is your dependent variable. So sales are dependent on advertising, okay? And your input X range is your independent variable. So advertising is not dependent on sales, it's the other way around. So, so my sales, sorry, what did I do? Becomes my Y and my advertising becomes my X, okay? So with that information in mind, Excel will run a regression for you and come up with your summary output. And what we're interested in here was, was the intercept as well as what your slope was, okay? So if I was to, where's my, one moment. So if I was to, ask myself what would be the, what would the, how would I describe this negative 8.13? What does that mean to me? This is from your basic math classes. So we know it's an intercept, okay? And since it's negative on the y-intercept, so I know it's gonna be somewhere down there. So let's assume that's our negative 8.1, okay? What does that mean? How would you interpret that? How do you interpret this uh, 8.1 that we have right here? No, that's not the slope. Okay. That's the y-intercept. But when you talk of the y-intercept, what does that mean? So it crosses the y. So it crosses the y, but from, uh, if you're trying to interpret it for somebody who's trying to figure out this information. So I know there's, a, there's, a, there's an intercept of, of eight, negative 8.1 and a slope of a line that's gonna be something like this. I know it's going to look something like that because that's a positive number for the slope. One, one on nine is positive. If that'd be negative, that slope would have been going that way. So I know there's a positive slope, uh, but the question that I'm asking is, what does this negative 8.1 mean to you? Does it have any meaning? You know it's the intercept, but what does the intercept here mean? So in this case here, if I was interpreting this, this tells me that if I didn't engage in any advertising, 
okay? Because here advertising dollars are zero. There's no advertising, big, there's no sp advertising spend right here. We're going to be having negative sales, like people might not be interested in buying our product, so we might not have uh, sales if there's no advertising, okay? Does that make sense? Maybe, maybe not, but it depends on the product, okay? If I had, uh, if my y intercept was somewhere here, basically that was, if that was just an eight, what that would tell me is that without any advertising, we'd be able to sell 8,000 units, okay, with no advertising. In this case, it tells me with no advertising, we are going to be, we're not going to be selling anything at all, okay? That's basically how you'd interpret the y-intercept here, okay? The slope tells you basically how much extra sales you're going to get for every extra dollar you put in advertising, okay? So here, uh, we, we have a slope of what, 109, okay? So expect to have approximately 109 uh, thousand units of sales for every thousand units of advertising that we put in, okay? All right, so now let's go into figuring out the rest of this table here, okay? The first question, now before we go into, into filling the table, let's, let me explain a couple of things that are of importance here. So we have this value of R squared, okay? And the value of R squared that we are given here is called a correlation coefficient. Coefficient, okay? And the correlation coefficient just basically tells us the, me the measure of, um, of how do these two variables move, okay? So the closer that number is to one, it means that uh, if it was exactly one, it means that if we had a line, it would almost be like a 45 degree line. <laughs> A one dollar increase in advertising leads to a one unit increase in 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 sales. Okay, in this case here, our R, uh, sorry, uh, oh sorry, no, that's not what I was. That should be a multiple R right here. Okay, so a multiple R basically tells us that the correlation is pretty strong. Is a, a multiple R of 97, which is like 97%. So the two, the two items, advertising and sales, move together in the same direction, and that correlation is very strong. Okay. The second thing that we have here, which is our R squared, is called our coefficient of determination. Of determination. And the coefficient of determination is also something that's of interest to us because it's, it's, it's similar to correlation, um, but it tells us something different. Correlation will always be between negative one to one. And if I, if I have a correlation close to negative one, it means that that relationship is very strong and, positive and negative. A correlation of one is a very strong relationship that's positive, okay? Our R squared value here, gives us uh, additional information about the nature of this relationship between uh, your y and x. And uh, we'll, I'll explain um, in slightly more details as we go into this, okay? So uh, last time we discussed the measures of forecast errors, let's take a moment and populate this table and um, see what measures of forecast error we're gonna arrive at here. So let's start off with, uh, now let's answer the question, let's forget about that. Let's answer this question right here. What's the regression equation? Okay. What's our y equals a plus bx? Given the information we have on that table or anything you see on the screen, what's our, what's our, what equation do we have here? I'm gonna give it a shot. What's our A? Right there. So A is our intercept, right? So our equation would be Y equals negative 8.13 plus B, which is our slope of 109.2. 
two three x. Okay, so that that would answer that first question. What's the regression equation? And once you have that regression equation, you can basically figure out uh, any amount of of uh, anticipated sales based off of this equation right here. All you have to do is plug in. Uh, whatever your x is going to be there. So if I want to see what would happen if I had 10,000, if I spent $10,000 worth of on, on advertising, then I change that x to 10,000, calculate that out and I'll be able to figure that out. Okay, so if I wanted to figure out what uh, sales would be for month six, i would basically just look at this formula we have here for our regression, which is that. Plus this multiplied by the advertising amount. Wrong place. It should have been here. So here, this should be up into my intercept. Okay, there we go. So this here would equal your intercept A, the negative eight, plus your slope multiplied by your advertising spend, okay? And so we come up with uh, the solution to that being that uh, if we spent 1750 on advertising, we'd end up with around 183,000 units worth of, of, of sales volume, <clears throat> okay? Um, the correlation coefficient, the coefficient of determination, that's information that you'd get off of your summary statistics. And then finally, is this question, calculate the measures of forecast error. Okay, so in terms of measuring the uh, measures of forecast error, let's start with the most basic. How do you calculate the errors? It's a difference between your forecast and your actual uh, demand, right? But in this situation here, what's our forecast? There's no forecast, right? So we have to add a column if we are to answer this. And I want us to do this because this is this might appear on one of your homework assignments. That might will actually appear on one of your homework assignments. So I would say add a column right here. Insert. And let's add a column for our forecast. Okay. Now, how do you get the forecast? The forecast here is this line here that we've calculated your regression line. That'll give you a forecast for every level of sales, for every level of advertising. So let's plug in that information and figure out what that will be. Okay. Give you a moment to do that. And how I would do this would be, my forecast would be using that formula we have there, negative eight plus this right here, multiplied by your advertising dollars, okay? And I'm going to hold this numbers constant because I want to drag my formula down, um, okay? We there? Just let me know if you need me to repeat what I just did. But basically, to get your um, your data associated with the different advertising dollars, uh, you'd have to get your intercept, your slope, multiply that by the advertising amount, and you come up with a number. Okay. 
Now the error is the difference between those two numbers. Okay, so the difference here becomes the actual sales volume minus the forecast. And one measure that's of interest to us is the cumulative forecast error, which is basically the sum of these errors. So we get the sum and this is a CFE. I like this. And in this case here, our CFE equals zero. That should be what you get. If you get an answer for your CFE, if you're doing a linear or a trend analysis and you get something other than zero, there's something wrong with your calculations. Okay. The reason for that being that when you're doing a when you're doing a linear regression, your data points will fall on both sides of this line. And when you average them out, because you have almost an equal number of points on above and below the line, and this is the best line of fit, it should, um, it should average out to zero. The positives and the negatives should be around the same. And so your, your community forecast error should equal zero, okay? If it equals anything other than that, then go back and figure out where did you go wrong in your formula. Okay, so let's go to the next calculation, which is the absolute error. And the absolute error is just basically taking out that negative sign from your formula and uh, getting what that error is, the, the magnitude of error regardless of the sign. So here we just do an absolute formula, ABS, get that and drag that down. Too many decimal points. And I'd like you to sum that up as well. But now rather, what, what's of interest for us in column F is the mean absolute deviation, okay? So not the sum of the absolute deviations, but the mean of the absolute deviations. And that would equal this divided by the number of periods or uh, data points that we have. And here we have five months worth of data. So I'll divide that by five and I get a figure of 8.09. So this now becomes um, my mean absolute deviation. And let's continue plugging this along. So this next column has a squared error. Squared error is just basically you're going to take column E, multiply it by itself and come up with a value. So that'll equal negative 0 0.9 uh, raised to the second power. Okay. Too many decimal points again. And once we have that, drag your formula down and again, get the sum total and then get the average. And that gives you a mean squared error. Okay. And finally, we calculate our mean absolute percentage error um, by looking at what's your absolute values, divide that by your actual sales figures. So that would equal the absolute error divided by sales and use a percentage sign there. Two decimal places and drag that down. All right, so okay. So 
So this is your mean absolute percentage error. The last measure that we're going to use. So this is the, these uh, values give us useful information, but it becomes even more useful when you have multiple approaches to forecasting and that's what we want to try and do. Okay. So this tells me on average, the difference between my forecast and my actual uh, sales values are around 5.75%, uh, okay? Not too much, but again, depending on how close you want your focus to be to zero, that could be big, okay? So we have measures that we can use and say, okay, we have a pretty decent forecast, okay? Those forecast errors values would make more sense if I had some other forecasting approach that I wanted to compare this with. So let's look at a number, a number of other forecasting approaches that we can use to find, then determine whether this is the best way to forecast this information. Okay. So uh, let's look at uh, what are considered time series forecasting measures. Okay. So rather than looking at regression, which is our first approach, now we go to time-based or time time series based measures of, of forecasting. A time series based basically involves uh, looking at historical data and trying to make a projection of the future. This did not really incorporate historical information. Okay, this is more predictive just on the basis of uh, advertising, much as we have months here. Uh, the sales figures that you have here are more dependent on the advertising rather than on the monthly demand, okay? So let's look at, uh, go to tab two where we have your naive forecast. This is the most basic forecasting approach that you could have. And uh, the instances where you could use this. So the naive forecast assumes that our forecast, if we're in the month of, this is April, right? Our, our, our demand for April would equal our, our forecast for April will equal our demand for March. Okay, that's all it does. It doesn't, and you don't engage in any calculation apart from looking at what are our previous month's demand. Let's use that as our forecast. Okay, very basic. It has its uses, but it's very limited. Okay, so in this example here, all you do for a naive forecast is to look, look back one time period and come up with that as your forecast. Okay, so if somebody asks, what's the forecast for month four? I'd look to month three and use that as my forecast. Okay, so very basic. Our forecast for time period 10 equals to our demand for time period nine. No math needed there. All you have to do is just visualize, look, that, look at the data you have, look back one month, boom, you're done. Okay, but that's not of interest to us. It's very rare that you're gonna get a situation that life is that easy and our forecasting becomes that easy. So go to the next tab. I will start there because that, that is an approach that, some, that people use. And let's look at the simple moving average, okay? So the simple moving average asks you to create a forecast on the basis of an average of, instead of using just one month, um, which was what we had with the naive forecast. The naive forecast just basically asks you what uh, gives you a one month moving average, okay? But now rather than using a one month moving average, the simple moving average says, let's take a couple of months together and come up with a forecast based on a number of months, okay? So we could have a two period moving average, three period, four period, five period, all depends on what you want to do. And the first question we have here is what's the forecast for period 10 using a two month moving average, okay? So that requires you to get the average of uh, the two months prior to period 10 and that becomes your forecast for period. Uh, I mean, so the demand for period eight and nine become your forecast for period 10. Okay, so again, it's very simple, straightforward. I would start here because the first forecast I would be able to calculate would be for period three, which would be average of periods one and two. And if I drag that down, then I find that my average for period 10 is 445. Okay. The second question we have here is what's the forecast for period 10 using a three month moving average? 
And let's do that by adding a column here. Um, copy and paste. All right, so it's in, since a three month moving average, uh, the earliest I can get on average would be period four. That's when I have three months worth of data. So I'll start in period four and say that um, my forecast for period four is equals average of period one, two, and three. Okay, so having a three month moving average gives us a slightly different figure for the forecast. Uh, the question that arises, which of these two is better? How do you know that? Which of these two are two month moving average or three month moving average? Which one, which one would be better given the data? Is there any way of determining which of those two approaches is better? No. You know, I'm gonna give it a shot. Should we go with a three month moving average or a two month moving average? One way of doing this is to visualize it, right? So let's visualize these three sets of data. Insert, chart. So now we have um, information that looks like this. So demand is the blue line, uh, that's right here. And then the orange line is your forecast based off of the two month uh, two period moving average. And then that purplish line is a three month moving average. How do you really tell which one's better at forecasting? Might not be as easy, right? Okay. How do we go about doing that? How we go about doing that is by calculating our measures of forecast error. Okay. The, once you run your measures of forecast error, the, the approach that gives you the smaller uh, measure of forecast error becomes your better approach. So I could quickly just put here error with the two month period, two month moving average, and then error with the three month moving average. Okay. So always start where you have data. If there's no data here, don't calculate an error. It won't make sense. So I'll start here for the two month and calculate the difference that minus this. And for the three month, I'll start there. That minus what I have here. Okay. And make sure you go up till month nine. Don't go into month 10 because you don't have information in month 10. Okay. All right. So now we have info that we could use. So let's first of all calculate the sum of forecast errors. Okay. So just by looking at these two numbers, it looks like the two month moving average has a slightly larger measure of forecast error, but I wouldn't use that. That's, that's too basic for me. I'd have to, I, I usually rely on, on the mad calculation. So I'll go ahead and do the absolute. Um, let me do the absolute errors. For the two month moving average and then do the same for the three month. All right, so our errors here equals to absolute. Drag this across. Drag it down. 
I have one more period here. Okay. So if you remember what we did for the absolute errors, we have to sum them up, get the total of the absolute errors. And that gives us 439 and 364. And then you divide it by the number of time periods that you have. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that divide by seven. And here we have 364 divided by six time periods. So these are MAD values for MAD. The mean absolute deviation. Okay. So now I have data I can work with and to try and determine what's a better approach. Okay. And remember what I said, the smaller the forecast error, the better the measure. In this case here, when I look at the calculation of MAD, the three, uh, three period moving average, this is not two, this is three, has a lower mean absolute deviation. So that tells me that I'll be better off using a, a three month moving average rather than a two month moving average. Okay. That's how you'd make that determination of which would be a better approach. And even when you're comparing uh, the simple moving average approach to the naive approach, the linear regression approach, that's one thing that you want to consider. Which one has a smaller MAD, has a smaller MAPE, that would be the better forecast to use. Okay. Um, then we move on to a weighted moving average. Okay. And the weighted moving average approach assigns a, a weight to your forecast. Okay. And so when you're trying to forecast some future demand, we say that sometimes not all months are equal, not all time periods are equal. Some periods might have a hold more weight than others. Okay. And an example of this would be if, if I was trying to forecast demand for ski boots, okay, or winter boots, and we were looking to figure out what's what's the best uh, possible uh, way to weigh previous demand figures. If I was in the if if month six right here was uh, July, so July, August, September, October, which month would you want to have more weight, add, assign more weight to? So let's, let's do that here. So if, say this is July, Let's bring it up as well. And you want to forecast, you'd like to forecast uh, sales of snow boots for the month of November. How much weight would you give sales of snow boots in July on a scale of zero to one? So chances are that you, you believe that there are not too many people buying snow boots in July. Okay, so I'll, I'll give this a weight which is really uh, pretty small, 0 0.01 or something like that. And then, as we get closer to that time period that we think sales are going to be slightly higher, you start assigning greater greater weights, maybe a 0 0.2, 0 0.2 September, maybe a 0 0.3, and October maybe a 0. Or something like that. Okay. Your weights have to sum up to one. And uh, when you do this, what what ends up happening is that you give more weight to those periods where you feel would most impact your ability to forecast a, a specific period accurately. Okay. So if that's the case, then and I want to figure out what this is going to be. So rather than just getting an average, as we did in the previous tab, the average here, if I took a four period average, would be 477.5, 477.5. So rather than forecasting and saying, yeah, I think um, that's, uh, let's focus 477.5. Let's make this 0.1. Why don't we get a weighted average and say some product And I'm going to take these four uh, 
periods of demand and multiply them by their corresponding weights. Uh, what did I do? E7, E10. R E2. Okay. So I get a figure of 473. Okay, which is slightly less than the 477. But if I felt that uh, October's demand was more relevant to what November is going to be, then I wanted to have given October slightly more weight. That's what I would have done. So any changes I make to this would bring it closer to what what I want my focus to be. So if I wanted my October to be almost what my focus is going to be and everything else to be much smaller. Um, 0 0.5, 0 0.04, 0 0.01. Okay, you notice because I put so much weight on October, that closely approaches what I have for October. Okay. So the weighted average enables you to play around and assign weights to what you feel. And this is sub there's some subjectivity to this. The forecaster has to determine what exactly is the weight that you're going to put on a given period. Okay. So that's the weighted average approach. The last approach that we're going to talk about is exponential smoothing approach. Um, the last tab that you have. And the exponential smoothing approach is an approach that is really convenient to use, especially when you don't have uh, when you don't have um, a lot of demand information. You might all that this requires is for you to have at least one period of demand, one period for a forecast, and you can calculate everything else. Okay. So the only thing that we add here that's different from the rest is that we add what's called a smoothing constant alpha. And this smoothing constant alpha does what we did in our weighted moving average here, which is to determine, do you want to have, to give more weight to your forecast or to give more weight to your actual demand? So let me explain that here. So let's look at time period one. Okay, so Bill here is a forecaster and I'm trying to figure out what's the, what's the forecast for, for February or period two going to be. Okay, and at that time I only have two pieces of information. I have what my forecast was and I have my demand figure and I'm trying to determine what should my, what should my forecast be for time period two, okay? I could go the naive route and say that let's make my forecast for period two equal to the demand for period one. So if that's the case, then I'd have a 275 there, okay? Or I could decide and say, I think let's maintain the forecast for that first time period. Um, so let's make February's forecast 268. Okay, those are two extremes. Okay. Usually you want it to be somewhere in between those two. Um, that's where this for, uh, exponential smoothing for, formula comes into play. What we have here, where we have uh, We have a smoothing constant, and that smoothing constant will always be between zero and one. Okay, so this, the formula for exponential smoothing is that smoothing constant, whatever you choose it to be, multiplied by your demand, and to that you're going to add one plus, sorry, minus your smoothing constant multiplied by your forecast in the current period. Okay. So let's, let's assume that I wanted to use a smoothing constant of zero, okay? So if, if I had a smoothing constant of zero here, and let's plug in that, the numbers we have there. So we have uh, alpha equals to zero. Alpha equals to zero. And I'd forecast the demand for period two using the formula that I have down here. And let's see what that gives us. So if we do that, we have alpha multiplied by your demand for period one. And to that, you're going to add one minus alpha 
times the forecast for the previous time period. Okay, so it gives you a figure of 268. And if you look above here, 268 is the forecast for the previous time period. Okay, so in the first instance here, when alpha equals to zero, we get a forecast of 268 for period two. If I change this alpha to a one, uh, it gives me a forecast of 275. Okay, so those are the two extremes that you're going to have using exponential smoothing, where one, uh, if alpha is, is approaches one, you're basically telling your system, let's rely more on the demand for the previous time period. If alpha approaches zero, it says let's re rely more on the forecast. That might be more accurate for us. So let's, let's uh, give the forecast more weight than the actual demand figure. Okay, that's basically all that alpha does here. Okay, so usually uh, you're not gonna use either one or zero because that then limits your forecast to what the previous month's forecast was. So the forecaster has to make a determination of um, what, what value of alpha should I use. And most commonly the numbers that you'd see are 0 0.1 or 0 0.2. And based off of that, you can make a determination on uh, what your forecast is going to be. So if we have a 0 0.2, for example, it changes my forecast to a 269.4. And once you have that formula in place, you'd, all you'd have to do then would be to drag your formula down and you can calculate your, your forecast for some future time period. Okay. So that's exponential smoothing. The thing to remember here is just that when you have very little data and you're trying to make a determination of forecasting with uh, very limited information, you don't have historical information, use the exponential smoothing approach. Now, there is a way of doing this in Excel that will simplify your lives so that you're not always trying to remember that formula. And that would be to go to your data tab, go to data analysis, and what are we doing? Exponential smoothing. Okay. So for exponential smoothing, it just requires you to input your data range. Usually for most questions, you'd be given that column B. That becomes your data range. Okay. So you'd highlight that. <clears throat> and then your dumping factor. Uh, this is where Excel kind of messes people up. Your dumping factor is not your alpha. Your dumping factor is actually one minus alpha. So what we have here. So if you've given a question where you're told alpha is equals to 0 0.3, your dumping factor will be 0 0.7. Okay, and that's all the information that you need to, to have. So if I had an alpha, a dumping factor of, if my alpha was 0 0.1, then my dumping factor would be 0 0.9. And then I'll choose my output range, wherever you want that to be, usually it'd be in your forecast column. And then say, okay. Okay. And it'll give you some data. Okay. And that, that's a quick way of being able to, to do the exact same you did, thing you did when you're doing it manually, doing the calculations by hand. Um, so you'd have that type of information, okay? Um, and you can, I believe you, could, you should be able to drag this formula down and get a forecast for that time period down there, okay? So any questions on any of these four approaches? Uh, the thing with this is just remember, practice, uh, get a spreadsheet, practice, try and figure out if there's anything you don't understand, go back to the textbook, uh, try and understand it better. But, Forecasting methods are pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Once you figure them out, uh, there's one last approach that we'll cover on Friday, which might be slightly more complex, but their overall objective is to come up with a forecast. And once you've come up with that forecast, ask yourself whether that's the best forecasting approach. And the only way to, to get that answer is to determine what's, which one has the smallest forecast error. Okay, so once I, once I, populated my information here, I would have to go back and calculate my measures of forecast error, come up with my MAD, my MAPE, figure out is the exponential smoothing approach better than the weighted average approach. If it is, continue using that. If not, 
used as um, an alternative method. Okay. Um, all right, so hopefully with this, you should be able to finish your homework questions um, without, a, without any, an issue. Okay. All right, I'll see you on Friday.